Anyways, with that being said, we've got three more weeks in the book of, or the letter to the church of Philippi. Three more weeks. And so we're going to look at verses 15 through 21 of chapter 3 uh, today. Uh, but before we really do that, I can hear, I love hearing Bibles, pages turning. It's so good. Uh, before we do that, really dive in, let me pray for us, and then we'll be underway. Uh, Lord, we want to acknowledge that our eyes are naturally set on that which is below, because there's so many things in our lives that we're walking into church with this morning that are cares of this world. But Lord, we would ask that you would do something in our midst today. Would you do the work of the Holy Spirit that lifts our gaze upward, that gets us off just the things that are in the back of our mind right now that want to be distractions? Would you lift up our eyes so that we would aim toward heaven today? That, that's our prayer. Lord, do what we can't do on our own. Re, reset our focus in the name of Jesus, we ask, as we look at this passage together. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, let's get to work. Verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way, Paul says. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. And then he says in verse 16, only, hold, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Um, I, <laughs> I have got to speak with a mentor um, about a couple weeks ago, and something that I had was had observed was uh, I spend uh, time dicing up God's word, getting an understanding of it, so that I would be able to get it in me, so I would be able to get it out to you on a weekly basis. And um, one of the the tasks of being a preacher or a teacher is seeing how much has been retained, and it. If you're a teacher, you're always disappointed, right? Because you're always going, the teacher always learns the most about what's happening in that thing that he's talking about. And so I'm telling this to my mentor and I'm saying, oh man, I, I'm, I, I'm teaching and yet I don't know if everyone gets everything that I'm saying. Um, like for example, let me ask you this. Don't answer. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez was here last Sunday. What did he talk about? Just, just take a minute. Think about it. What did, what did he say? Could you, could you give the whole sermon that he said? I can't. Okay, now I'll go two weeks back, all right? That was me. Do you remember what, what was preached on when we were looking at Philippians 3? Okay, I'm seeing some, some smirks, right? And it illustrates the point. And so I'm complaining to my mentor, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm learning how this process works. And he says, well, let me ask you a question. Do you remember what you had to eat for dinner um, last Tuesday night? And I thought about it, and I went, well, Justine... Did a great job, I'm sure, of cooking an excellent meal. But no, I don't remember what we had to eat that night. And he goes, that illustrates the point. You don't remember what it was necessarily, but you were nourished. And that's why you're still here. And so that's the same thing for us, is that we may not remember everything, but there's that reinforcement work that happens in this moment that reminds us of who God is in his word that nourishes us. So let's let the word continue to do that. Uh, one, let me give you some practical things as we get going this morning. I think this will be helpful. When we come into church and we're, we're hearing God's word, we sing the songs, you are bringing something into church. Not only am I bringing something as I'm communicating to you. So I want to encourage you in a few ways. This will help, I think, as you get Philippians in you. Read the passage before you show up to church on a Sunday morning. I'm pre preaching th verses 3, 15 through 21 in the beginning of chapter 4. You might be willing to bet what's going to happen next week. I'm going to be in 4, 2 through 9, the next section. It's not that hard, right? And so I would encourage you, read the passage beforehand and go, okay, I've got an understanding of this. This will help me. Another thing that would be helpful is take notes when you preach. I see some of you guys do that. It's such a good thing to do. It's my job. Thank you, Leroy. I appreciate that. Um, it's my job to be able to give what's from God's word in such a way that it's worth writing down. But when you utilize the other senses, it helps, you be able to get, it helps you to be able to get it in you. And then the last thing I would say is, do you pray in light of what you've read here? Do you pray, Lord, like we looked at a couple weeks ago, Lord, you have called me to be the kind of person that, that strains forward to what lies ahead and forgetting what's behind. Lord, would you help me to be able to do that this week? Pray out of a result of what we've seen here. So with that being said, let me get us up to speed. In chapter 3, Paul has essentially said, 
everything that I used to be, my credentials and the things that I had earned, my upbringing was worthless in comparison to knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, who has justified me gr by grace through faith, through the work that he has done on the cross. And so since he's done that, I want to be the kind of person that sprints forward like, like, a, like a mile distance runner at the end at that last hundred meters. And I'm leaning forward because I want to win the prize of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That goes right with what Brian was saying just a few minutes ago. And so if that's true, if I want to be the kind of person that strains toward that prize of having Jesus to die is gain, brother, I want to be able to live with that right kind of mindset. So when he says, verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way, that's everything that he's been talking about. A mature Christian has that kind of mindset. And so a mature Christian is not consumed by the cares of this world, but is consumed by the next one. Have you ever heard of C.S. Lewis? I think most of us have heard of C.S. Lewis. He's that guy that we love to quote, but we actually, most of us have never read his books. But C.S. Lewis is that famous 20th century Oxford intellectual, and he puts it this way. He says, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim to heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. And so Paul is aiming toward heaven. He is aiming toward heaven and he calls you and I to move beyond the cares of this world and see what lies ahead. Because for him... You put aside what won't matter in the end, but you care about that which is eternal. You notice how he says in verse 15 and 16, he says, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. I love that because he's being kind of a, a unifier here. And he's like, if you disagree with some of what I'm saying, I'll let God handle you. I'll let him take care of it. And then he moves right along. And then he says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. If you have the NIV with you, I think it, it sheds more light on, on this. It puts it this way. It says, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Like if you ever needed a verse to tie the statement of practice what you preach together to, it's this verse right here, that you would practice what you preach. And so this is it. And so he says, mature Christians don't just have that godly perspective. Mature Christians act upon that godly perspective. They don't just stay in the level of thinking, they move on to the level of acting. And so for those of us who have spent any length of time in church, many of us, I think, have the right answers. The question is, do you actually believe it? And do you show that belief in how you act? We say we believe in the power of prayer, but my question to you is, how's your prayer life been this week? We say we, re God, we, we value God's word. It's the inerrant. It's the infallible. It is the um, inspired. Add more adjectives to express how wonderful it is. Bible, word of God. But do you read it? Do you read the book? Do you believe in the fruit of the spirit? I don't think there would be any Christian in here who would say, no, I don't believe in the fruit of the spirit. But let me ask you. When you look at your life this last week, can you actually say that you are the kind of person that is loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, gentle, and who has self-control? The mature Christian doesn't just have the godly perspective, he acts upon it. And so I think that the reason why I take time to really point this out is because what breaks my heart is seeing those who call themselves Christians in church, not just for a few years, but 10, 20 years, and, and even more than that. They call themselves Christians, but there's no evidence in their life that they're, they're striving to look more like Jesus, to look more like Jesus. There's no clear desire to do that. They love the community of friends in the church. They love singing the songs. They don't fall asleep when the guy up front is preaching, but there's no evidence that they have moved on from from one stage to the other. There's no growth. There's no maturity. Like my heart breaks for people like that because 
I remember hearing a sermon one time uh, where, where a guy said there's three kinds of people. There's those who are saved, those who are not saved, and those are, there are those who think that they're saved. And the one, that last group right there that has such a burden in my heart that I have a burden for is that last group who thinks that they're saved, but nothing in their life is changing. You know why my heart breaks for people like that? It's because that's who I used to be before the Lord got a hold of me. And so my heart really reaches out to people like that. So let me give you two questions as a diagnostic to see where you're at this morning. First, first question would be like this for this diagnostic. Do a yearly check-in and ask this question. Am I further along this year than I was last year? My youth pastor used to say this to me. Could you go back to, rewind the tape, go back to October or go back to November 2021? What were you doing then? What was going on? How are you acting? And if you could... Then fast forward the tape to where you are right now. Could you say that you don't fall as prey uh, to those things that frustrate you, your temptations? Um, where were you? Where are you now when you think of your own habitual sins? Um, could you honestly say that you have matured in the last year in comparison to this point uh, from last year? And if you have any doubt about that, you can just ask your wife, and she'll definitely help you out in answering that question. And or you can ask your husband, or you can ask a loved one or a friend. They have no trouble being able to answer that for you. Let me give you a second question to ask. Do my actions at reveal, how do my actions reveal what I really believe? How you act shows what's really in your heart. So it's easy for us to say, I believe this. But it's another thing to actually look at what the actions reveal that's in the heart. Let, let me show you how this works. Am I angry? Am I an angry person? Because I doubt God's provision over my family. Friend, the reason why you may be an angry person is because you doubt that the Lord is the provider. Let me give you another one. Are you a gossiper? Am I a gossiper because I don't really, I don't really believe that God values who I am. And so I have to go somewhere else to find that value. And so I say words and I talk about others because it feels that sense of power to go, I can control maybe not my own situation, but I can control this moment how I talk about somebody else. Do you really that, believe that God is powerful? And you, do you really believe that God is in control? Do you really believe that God values you? It comes through in how you talk. Let me give you a third one. Are you prone to idols? Idols like the love of money, being an alcoholic, being a workaholic, excessive entertainment, certain comforts. You fill in the blank. We all know what it is for ourselves. But do you do those things because at the end of the day, you don't really believe that God satisfies? If he really is the good creator, if he really is the one who made me and knows what I am, him, I don't fall prey to idols. And so ask yourself really those why questions. August does this, my son, all the time to me. When I say, August, I want you to do this. And what's the question? Why, Daddy? Well, I have to think of a deeper reason. Well, why, Daddy? And he keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. And I eventually get to that point where I say one of two things. Because I said so, one. Or two, I run out of things to say. And that's the deepest reason. Do the same thing in your life. Ask those why questions. Why do I do this? And then when you can get to nothing else at bottom, that might be the thing that you glorify the most. That might be your reason for living right there. Christians don't just stay where they are. They get to the root of who they are and want to become more like Jesus. They demonstrate their godly outlook to sum it all up in how they live as they run aiming towards heaven. So if that's not practical enough, let's get into the next section here. So let's look at verse 17. Verse 17 says this. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. And so Paul has just said to us that mature Christians act and think this way. He then says, well, let me tell you the kind of people that you need to imitate in your life. Imitate me, Paul first says. And then he says, find other people that are godly, and you imitate them as well. And you got to remember, when Paul says something like this, there's significance to it. Because who is he? He is a good Jew. And a good Jew has a, a framework. You think about having a rabbi with his disciples that follow after him, just like Jesus and his students, right? And his disciples. And so in Paul's understanding, when he's saying, find people and imitate, he understands that 
that sometimes the best teaching is not just that which is said and taught, but that which is caught by looking at the rabbi, by looking at the teacher and seeing how he lives his life. I, I can tell you this has absolutely been true in my own life as I think about those who have impacted me, to get to me to where I am in this moment. Like, they have said things like you should care about certain doctrines or you should care about living in such a way that honors God and all of that. All, all the things I've said up until now, I have heard those things from other mentors. It's one thing for them to say, act this way, read this thing, pray this way, all of that. But it's another thing when I've seen those same men get emotional when they talk about Jesus. It's another thing when those same people that have impacted my life, when they're moved by what they're describing, what they're reading in God's word. You know what that does for a young man? Like, you, like, man, I fall asleep after two minutes of trying to pray, but for some reason when you pray, brother, like, you talk about Jesus like he's your friend. Like me, when I read God's word, I, I see so much in here, but that older mentor, he saw so much more. And so what it does for a young man in particular is that it makes you just curious and go, what is it that you're doing to get to that godly place where you've been for the last 20, 30 years? And let me, let me attach my, my train to what you're doing because I want to get there as well. It does that for the, for the younger Christian in the faith. What is that older Christian doing? Because I want to get there myself. And so my encouragement would be for you, if you go, man, I need mature Christians in my life, find someone and say, what have you done to get to the godliness that you have in your life? How are you disciplined? How are you focused? What are those things that you prioritize? And since I'm already here, I can't help myself. Make sure that you also find yourself some dead mentors as well. If you go into my office, you'll see I have a whole bunch of dead people on my shelves. Don't call the police. I'm talking about my books, okay? I'm talking about those old people, old pe theologians that have said things throughout the, the centuries. Don't just listen to people who are speaking right now in the present moment. Listen to the great voices of the 20th century. Names like C.S. Lewis, who we've read, A.W. Tozer, Elizabeth Elliot, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Drink from Spurgeon and the Puritans, Calvin, Augustine, Luther, and others. They have much to say. You will find that many of the questions that you have, there's no such thing as, there's nothing new under the sun. Almost every question that you have has been addressed by another Christian at some other, other point in Christian history. And so at your disposal, do you realize, like, when it comes to discipleship, you have more resources than any other Christian in the history of the world to become a better disciple whether it's podcasts or sermons or books or whatever. And so at your disposal is a symphony of Christian voices throughout the halls of Christendom that say, come and see, and I'm going to point you to Jesus. And so someone might say, that sounds like a little bit of effort. That sounds like a little bit of hard work. I don't know if I want to do that. And, and I would just want to respond this way. Feasting on the wisdom of other saints will help you grow in discipleship. Or you can remain where you are, and that might be much harder. Is discipleship hard work? The answer is yes. But I would argue that it's harder work to remain in ungodly character for you, for your family, for your spouse, for your kids, for those close friends around you, and your coworkers. I would say that's harder to live in such a way, in a way that does not honor God. So, friend, you choose today which one it will be, which way you will go. Before we go to the couple reasons Paul gives for why we're supposed to imitate here, I want to flip it around and say, and say the hard thing or, or say the thing that needs to be said. Because we can say, find other people to disciple you. And I want to say, well, who are those people going to be? Like, who are the ones who are qualified to do the work of making disciples? Is it the professionals? I hope you don't look at me when you think of professionals. Like, that's not me at all. Uh, who, who do you look at for that work of doing discipleship making? Here's how you're qualified. If you're someone who has believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. In other words, if you've been a Christian for more than two seconds, it is the work of all Christians to make disciples. Healthy disciples make disciples. So my question to Bethesda would be this. 
Who's going to be the Titus 2-4 older woman that is going to take younger women and show them how to love their husband and take care of their family? Who will see the younger guys here and look at them and say, hey, come here and let me show you what it's like to follow Jesus. Let me take you out to lunch. Let's get to, to know each other better. Here's something that's revolutionary. How about when we say that we're going to take someone out to eat, we actually do it and follow through on it. And we set a date and a time and say, okay, this is when we're going to do this. This is when it's going to happen. It's not that complicated. Act like the Christian that you desire other people at Bethesda to be. Two, be hospitable. Three, seek someone out and get to know them. And then four, leave the results to God. And when you leave the results to God, you realize how little you are capable of. Because for many of us who have done that work of discipleship making, you know that you can invest into someone and then they could just fall off the rails. They can abandon you. They can take things really seriously. Think of a conversation that, that we had at one point. I cannot take credit for anything, right? Because... Some people end up this way, some people end up another way. But my job is not to try, to try to force people to change. My job is to be faithful in my own character to what God has called me to do. So as we leave the results to Jesus, let us be the kind of people at Bethesda who can say, as we set an example, as we are the kind of people who know their Bible, who practice what they preach, who are slow to speak but quick to prayer, who are honest in their business dealings, who aren't tossed around by the culture. How about this? Who don't let the political climate of midterm elections steal their joy for being the kind of people who are supposed to do the work of being in Christ's kingdom first and foremost. Who are faithful to their spouses. Parents who raise up godly children. Who thrive in God-honoring singleness if God has called you to that. Who suffer but with tears of joy. Who love the Lord with all of their heart and with all their soul and with all their mind and with all of their strength. And who love their neighbor as, them, as themselves. That's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. That is not so concerned about what everybody else is doing. But is saying, Lord, how do you want to change my character so that I can be an impact on other people in this church and in my community? God has called us to be the people who look like Jesus and point others to him. So when Paul says, if you imitate me, you'll look more like Jesus. Oh, and if you see those Bethesda people, you go follow them, and you'll end up looking more like Jesus too. Paul then gives a couple grounds for this exhortation. Look at verse 18. He says, for many of whom I have often told you, and I'll tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. And so the first reason for being the kind of people that imitate others so that you would, you, you would reach Christ is that you need to watch out also for the enemies of the cross of Christ. You see that description there. There's five of them. Enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. And their mind is on earthly things. A lot of ink has been sp spilled in the commentaries to try to figure out who these people are that Paul's talking about. Like, are they the Judaizers, the dogs that Paul talks about in Philippians 3.2? Are they outsiders from the church of Philippi, the pagans and the culture that are trying to infiltrate within are, are they Christians that at one point uh, said they were Christians, but they went out of us, and so they, they weren't really of us? Uh, either way, the point is this. They invest in the wrong thing, and they set their aim on earth. And they get neither heaven or earth, nor earth. They're greedy. They disrespect others. They fall into sexual sin and laziness. They invest at the wrong thing at an incredibly high cost. I thought it would be helpful um, to bring up an illustration that is famous. And the problem with a famous illustration is it's not my own. And so I thought maybe I would put it on the screen or maybe I would do it myself. But let me just tell you about it. If you've ever heard of Francis Chan, probably his most well-known illustration, uh, he, writer of the book Crazy Love. I think that book's been out for about 10, 15 years now. His probably most well-known illustration is that he has a white rope that goes all the way out the sanctuary and the tip of the rope is just red, probably about just an inch. And what he does is he says, this rope represents the timeline of your life. And the red part right here, that's your time on earth. And the white part that goes all the way out the door, that's eternity right there. 
And he gets up there and he says, it's so funny how we spend so much time on this little red section right here. Like, like I'm going to work really, really hard right here in this point so I can retire right here and really enjoy this part right here. And so there's so much investment that happens right here at the expense of not thinking about the rest of eternity. And so for him, he says, we have one chance for this life on earth. And then comes eternity. Don't waste it on this little bit right here at the expense of everything else that comes next. But do you notice that Paul's posture is really profound? Do you notice how he talks about these people? He says, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, I do it with tears. He doesn't coddle them. He tells them exactly who they are. But he does it so with tears. When someone pointed this out to me, it really struck me in this way. Because you notice, it's as he's writing or as he's saying this to someone who's writing it down, he's saying, I'm doing it so with tears. And you imagine that Paul writing these things down with tears, thinking about these people of whom he is broken hearted to. Tears might fall down on the page and by the time he gives the, the, the letter to Epaphroditus and the Philippians receive it, it might be a soak filled piece of paper that he has, that those people have, that they're reading from. Paul keeps tough, Paul keeps tears together with tough words, according to one author. He keeps tears together with tough words. And I think this is a strong word. I'm a former young adults pastor, so this hits me in a certain way, as I've, I've seen young people who were raised in a godly household their parents trained up a child in the way that he should go or she should go, but for some reason that child ended up departing from it. And I've gotten to work with those in their 20s who have navigated coming back to Christ or thinking about whether they want to keep doing this. And I would want to say this to the mother or to the father who has a child who has walked away from the faith. You simultaneously hold that commitment of being strong and courageous to say the right thing while you hold together those tough tears at the same time. Tears with tough words. Monica is the mother of the most famous Christian after Paul to have ever lived. And Monica prayed for her son and never stopped praying. She kept praying. And at the end of her life, when he eventually responded to the Lord and he became a Christian, here's what she said in reflecting on what she had done to be faithful. She said, my hope in this world, she says to her son, is already fulfilled. The one reason why I wanted to stay longer in this life was my desire, son, to see you a Christian before I die. My God has granted this in a way more than I had ever hoped. For I see you despising this world's success to become his servant. She was proud of what her son had become. Who was her son? None other than the famous St. Augustine, who wrote these words in the beginning of his confessions. You, God, stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Thank God for Monica's prayers. But because of her prayers, we have the words of Augustine. Parents, do not compromise on God's word for the sake of your child, but through tears of sorrow like Paul, you turn to prayer and you put your trust and hope in God. There's a final reason, second reason, that Paul gives for why we should be the kind of people that imitate other Christians so that we would aim toward heaven. He said it's because your citizenship is in heaven and your future is glory. Here's what he says, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm, thus in the Lord. Though this world is wasting away, we know this. We have a dual citizenship. We have a citizenship that is in this world that we're supposed to be a light in the midst of darkness. But we have a citizenship of a better country that the Lord has called us to. Of a coming kingdom with a king whose reign will never end. Jesus is on the way and we look forward to his return. And here's who Jesus is. He is the one who needs no campaign manager because he is the one who props up governments and he tears them down. He does not need others to do stump speeches for him because he is 
the living word of God and he declares things better than anybody else can. He doesn't worry about the polls because every demographic is going to confess on their knees that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is not elected, he is the king, the king of kings. He will not have a public he will not have a public moral scandal like a political candidate a week before the election day because he is altogether pure, he is altogether lovely, he is altogether righteous, and he has never committed any sin. He does not worry about his government being overthrown because you might have heard his kingdom is not of this world. And so this one who has overcome death itself and his resurrection body that he now has, that if you believe in him, you get to have that same resurrection body. You can know that you will be transformed too. And hold fast to these words from 1 Corinthians. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed for this imperishable and this mortal body must be put on must put on immortality and when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality then shall come to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is your victory oh death where is your sting for the Christian, I have really good news. This world is as bad as it gets if you know Jesus Christ. This is as bad as it gets because there is a life to come in him. And our hope is in the one who has subjected all things to himself. Because if we are found in him, we have that same future as well. The question is, do you believe this? <laughs> and if you believe this, the answer is yes. Then act like it. And lean forward. As you run the race alongside Paul who did, alongside me, alongside other godly Christians. And live now with that glorious end in mind. Aiming toward heaven. And you will find back, you will find out that when Jesus comes back and heaven comes down to earth. If you will have believed in him. You who have aimed towards heaven will have gotten earth thrown in as well. Let's pray.